Suzanne, I'm going to start with you since the topic of the film is so uh, directly related to what you're studying. So can you talk about why emerging technologies um, are such a fit for the field of aging research and sort of what interests you about that? Yeah, What? so I um, spent 12 years um, in accessibility, how to make technology accessible to people with disabilities. And there's often this barrier to technology. If, if it's not made accessible, someone who is blind or someone who is deaf can't access it. So aging was this natural extension because often as we age, technology becomes more challenging. You, you don't feel like it's for you. It's not designed for you. Um, and I always think of, if you think of the technology today, like rideshare, it could be amazing for someone who had to give up their keys because they no longer can drive. But it's not necessarily designed for them. They don't feel, a lot of people feel like it's for them. So the elders of today are not the elders of tomorrow. However, how do we begin to remove that barrier to technology where everyone can get the benefit? Um, and how can we use it to augment your ability, and in this movie, it's, it really goes to the extreme of, of stepping in and, and trying to be that companion. Um, we are not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've interacted with any of these, um, you know, assistants, but they're also often are like, what did you say? Excuse me? <laughs> Alexa, Alexa, Alexa. <laughs> um, but it is, it's very interesting. So, um, you know, I do think um, technology can help someone essentially age in place and be more independent longer um, if we can find that right balance where um, it can understand the individual and, and understand the changes in ability and potentially um, expose a person to having that augmentation of their life. And I'll give one example, and then I'll let you. My, um, my mother, um, um, hearing isn't very well, and she came to visit her turn on closed captioning. She didn't know about closed captioning on the TV. And I realized if we talked about what we were watching later, she wouldn't really wouldn't have been able to participate because she didn't catch most of what was going on. But when I turned on closed captioning, which is she could read everything that was being shown on the show, she could she could, you know, get the information she needed to to engage with the conversation that would probably happen later, and it was interesting because she was, "What is this? Is it on my TV? And it's on everyone's TV." And I said, "Mom, it's for people who are deaf." Um, she's like, "But I'm not deaf, you know." Well, you wear hearing aids and you can't hear. Um, so it's it's interesting because what I find is. We don't necessarily identify with a disability as we age, even though we acquire it. And vanity never goes away. Um, you know, you don't, you always think of yourself like Walter, you know, and you have this young version of you're independent, you're fit, you're an adult. But as things change, you do become more frail. So that's where that interesting balance comes in. So before I ask, I, I do have a question for Adam, but before I ask it, I wanted to get a sense of what aspects of the, the research that you're doing are reflected in this future version of the primes that we see here. Did you, was there anything you could pick up on and say, actually, we are working on that? Well, you know, that proactive conversation, how, how does an assistant step in and when is it the right time to engage? So there's this um, assistant, it's a little, it's called Jibo. Um, and Jibo can recognize your voice and your face, so when you walk into the room, it can say, hi, Suzanne, and it sounds really interesting, And except when it interrupts me in conversations. It doesn't know someone else is in the room, and I'm talking to someone and be like, hi, Suzanne, do you want to play Word of the Day? And it's like, no, Jibo, I'm, I'm talking. And But that said, um, when I first unboxed it and it was in my kitchen, I was in my kitchen, and it said to me, I walked in in the morning, and it's like, hi, Suzanne you're really good at being you. <laughs> I was like, oh, Jivo, thanks. Like, it actually did make me feel good. <laughs> so I think there's this interesting balance that this movie really touches upon. When does it become creepy, or when is it soothing, or when is it fun? You know, there's, it's a, it's a, you see the fine line in the acting of like, you cross the line, like when he threw the drink, like, no, you're not getting it. You're not understanding. 
Yeah, which goes right into the question I have for you. So Adam, you have this amazing TED Talk, which I encourage everybody to watch. And in it, you describe a first encounter with a robot and how it didn't really go as planned. So can you talk a little bit about that? So you want a retelling of it? <laughs> um, yeah. So there are these uh, robots made by SoftBank called Peppers. They're about mm. this high, uh, if you're sitting down. And uh, they're actually pretty receptive to having things uh, side-loaded on it. So it has its own personality and its own getup, but we play with them to load bits of Watson on there. And um, there was a, a company-wide uh, competition uh, where everybody was being asked to come up with ideas to uh, use AI to solve some problem that we all had at IBM. And they turned the seventh floor of our design studio into like this game show, sort of like um, Dragon's Den or Shark Tank. And, and they were, all the contestants who were on this were, were there for two days. And I had read about these, uh, these pepper robots and I walked around the corner and there in the kitchen was one of those pepper robots just sort of sitting you know, at a banquette. You know, the table was right there. And I was like, this is awesome. I can't wait to check it out. And as I was walking up to it, I started to think, like, well, what am, what am I supposed to say to it? Like, do I walk up and, like, shake its hand? Do I tap its head? It's got a tablet on it. I didn't know how to say hello or what to do. I found myself getting a little nervous, so I decided to, like, sit down and just check out the industrial design of the robot. And I'm looking at its treads and its fingers and the touchpad. And... I'm looking at its head, and you know its eyes are optical sensors, and I'm like this far away from it, and it just turns its head towards me and unfurls its fingers and does this, and I was like, uh, no, and I walked <laughs> away. And I, I got back to my desk, and I was like, you've been waiting your whole life for this moment. I'd grown up seeing Star Wars, C-3PO, and R2-D2 and all that, and um, this was like right up my alley, and I could not understand why I had the willies as bad as I did. And I realized that it, it was that I didn't know how to relate to it, and it certainly didn't know how to relate to me. And I was chastising myself at my desk, you know, get back in there and go talk to that robot. <laughs> um, but I had just started on my journey of um, trying to understand what it really means to design for artificial intelligence. And I realized a few things in that moment. One was, um, there has to be an easy way for us to sort of do the shaking hands or how do you do? I mean, we just human? met outside. Yeah, hum human. Well, That's what Soft Pepper says. Like, it does, yes. human? Yeah. Like, no. if it doesn't understand you, that's its response. Yeah. Human? <laughs> <laughs> but we just met each other, you know, two hours ago. We shook hands in the lobby, and, and that's a common sort of thing. But when it comes to how do you meet a piece of technology, it's all about how that piece of technology is designed to introduce itself to you. And the other thing that I realized is by IBM's definition of what cognitive computing is, uh, it means that a machine has the capability to understand, reason, learn, and interact. And I had this epiphany at that moment where it, these are the core building blocks that we base all of our relationships on. Like, we have some relationships that are forced out of necessity or, you know, because they're there, we're born into them. But most of our relationships is are based on like, does somebody understand what I have to say? Can I teach them something? Am I learning something from them? Can we interact on this? And so uh, I've started to focus all of my work on how do we use the building blocks that we have available to us now um, to start forming the basis of a meaningful relationship between a human and a machine and have it last. And that's what I found so compelling about the film is that so much of it is based on um, what memory plays its role in forming a relationship. And uh, I was watching, just before we ran out the door to come over here, I, I was re-watching Blade Runner 2049, and it, it's the same motif where it's about what does a machine remember about itself, and in all of these cases, it's what we tell it to remember. And so therefore, the, f the copy of a copy of a copy starts to play into it. And something else that I think about just ethically, um, and there's no real answer for this yet, but you have these three AIs that they sort of have no purpose anymore. And so do you kick the plug out? Are they, are they like our iPhones where we trade them in to get a new iPhone? Or, you know, they're semi-sentient, at least these ones are. So w what are their rights? If they can remember all of these things, that, then what? 
And in that, you know, that last scene, what when you watch that, what are you thinking that those robots want? What what do those a AIs ultimately desire? You know, they say, I want to be more human, but in that last scene, we almost get a different image of what they want. Well, I think there's clues spread throughout it, but Marjorie Prime says it is she wants to learn and she wants to learn more. And what they were doing is creating this feedback loop where now the humans weren't telling them stories for them to remember. It was them telling each other stories. And Walter Prime closes the loop with the subplot of Damien by telling them something that they had never heard before. And then the question is, well, what do they do with it? And where do they go when they've exhausted all of their stories? And he, he hints at it, Walter Prime hints at it, where he says, you know, don't, don't laugh at me, but I've been thinking about writing music. Mm -hmm. So if anything, that's sort of like the wink to say, if you give an AI enough time, which is forever, <laughs> uh, and sometimes their forever happens like in the blink between milliseconds, um, are they going to want for themselves anything, regardless of whether it means being creative or not? Uh -huh. I, I just have to add something. Um, w what I find interesting about, and it's the experience with Pepper, because I have, a, a, we have a lot of Peppers in my lab, <laughs> and uh, I'm always begrudgingly demoing Pepper and letting people interact with it, but it doesn't understand me. I, something about my tone and my voice, I have to talk really deep for Pepper to, <laughs> understand me. Um, not all um, interactive systems are like that, but w what, I, what I think is interesting is movies like this start to set this expectation. Right. And, and we have this expectation that AIs w want to have a life after their purpose. Y you know what I mean? This, it's very much, um, and, and I think what's challenging for technologists is to meet the expectation of what can be done in a movie and those interactions. Um, because we, we aren't there yet. It's, it, does, it does enable us to test out theories and test out the ethics and what does that really play out to be, um, but it also sets this expectation of, you know, I expect the pepper to, you know, understand me and I can ask it any question and it's going to respond and give me a good answer, but it's, you know, the technology is going to grow as as we use it more. Well, and this, th there's something interesting. So Suzanne and I were talking about this before the movie started, and the original uh, Motorola flip phone, the gray one that was, um, it flipped down. It, the reason it is that way is that the engineers at Motorola were Star Trek, Star Trek nerds, and so they <laughs> wanted their own communicator. <laughs> and so oftentimes, Computer. yeah, um, <laughs> fiction informs what we, as the people who actually make these uh, objects and experiences choose t to put into it. And the thing that I find interesting about this field particularly is that um, oftentimes when we talk about AI or uh, when you hear it being talked about elsewhere, um, people say, well, what if they want to dot, dot, dot? And the interesting thing is machines can't want something until they have emotion. And there is a huge gap between where we are today and having machines feel something. And if it's just a bunch of engineers trying to make the pieces fit together, they'll never get there. But if you have people who really care about whether or not something that is intelligent should have emotion, well, now there's an ethical discussion to have there. And we push our own uh, relationship needs into anything that we come across. Anybody here, show of hands. Uh, You've named your car, <laughs> right? Why do we name our cars? You know, like in Han Solo, he pounds on the wall of the Millennium Falcon. He tells it to hold together, you know? We personify the objects in our lives. You know, we've, we beg our laptops to hang on for just five more minutes of battery <laughs> power, right? We're already forming these relationships. When machines have the capability of holding a conversation, it starts to set up the beginning of an illusion. And so you can play with the illusion of it um, wanting something or trying to help when it's following a set of cascading rules that has intelligence behind it, but it, it doesn't want it for itself. I have one more question for you guys, and then I'm going to turn it over um, to the audience. But can you talk, Suzanne, about the effectiveness of this technology and also for both of you the thing that you were like, that's never going to happen. Like, if you could call out a moment in the film that was like, 
uh, other than the emotion that the I, you know and showing. i i i just when i was watching it i watched it before and this second time seeing it um i i read somewhere and i and i wish i had time to to look up the stat or the the research but it was research that especially people with um depression or mental illness or you know that ha have are, are going through something that the idea of conversing through a chatbot or conversing with um, a, a technology is is almost more therapeutic than a, a person because the person it's it's it was the the research was like they they feel that they were being judged more but you don't feel really judged by your technology um, so I think that's really interesting in a way it's, that this kind of touches upon. Except, um, for, except for when she says at the very beginning, I feel like I have to perform for you. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's that that expectation of how do I interact with you? Sure. Like, what what am I supposed to do with you? Um, yeah, but um, as far as like aging in place and the technology, um, just understanding the 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 change in decline, especially with someone with dementia, um, understanding the severity of it and the the in and out of um, clarity could really be beneficial, especially if someone was aging in place, had early onset of dementia, and it was conversing, and you could see that change, and you could see the change um, over time, and if it was it was becoming worse, you could act on that information. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the things that we're looking at is how could objectively some sensors in a home understand how someone is managing aging in place and that change of ability over time of when is it the right time to kind of step in and offer assistance. Mm -hmm. And and humans cannot look at it objectively. You, you saw in the relationships in this movie, you you have your opinion of someone or mom's fine, no mom's not fine, you're not there. And like there's this battle of is she okay? And, and if you had something a little more objective to look at like data, then you could potentially see something and act on the information and not have that emotional heartstring that's that's that you know leading you astray maybe. Yeah. So um, the least believable bit of the whole movie for me was actually the three-dimensional projection of it in <laughs> space. Everything else I can actually see the path to just about everything that you see there, um, down to that. Uh, sort of catchphrase keyword like I'll remember that now like th there's already forms of that you know like I can if I, when I do uh, I did voice training for my Alexa at home and now if I ask for a flash briefing it'll say Adam here's your flash briefing so it recognizes my voice from my wife's voice from my children's voice and so it, it can recognize me and now that's just fleshing it out with detail and responsiveness um, being able to make it feel like you're sitting here talking to someone and have it real, that's that's very difficult to do. <laughs> Especially to have it like stand up and walk around the room and look pensively out the window and <laughs> <laughs> you know. and not say human? <laughs> human? Yeah. But like that that well, that again, that's <laughs> like feeding it uh, feeding any machine um a deeper knowledge of like vernacular and colloquialisms and that sort of thing. It will pick up that eventually. Um, but for it to decide, well, actually, even then, so I just worked on this project. I don't know if any of you saw it. Um, IBM did a thing called Project Debater where um, this artificial intelligence uh, debated not just anyone, but the 2016 Israeli national debate champion. And um, it can autonomously craft four-minute uh, pro or con positions to whatever it hears for the first time in the moment that the moderator uh, puts the, the prompt there, and then listens to the human debater as the debater, uh, the, the opponent is making its point. It takes like 60 seconds, 30 to 60 seconds to process what it just heard and then come back with a rebuttal, all in real time. And there was one point in the second debate that they did uh, where debater, and I'm not going to get it quite right, but it basically said, if I had blood, it would be boiling right now. <laughs> and the whole room was like, <gasps> <laughs> and so that as a witty sort of uh, analogy um, was written. There's a bank of those that are written by a human, but it chooses when to pull that out and use it in the right context, which it did. 
So I was about to say before I stopped myself, you know, when would a machine be like, now is a good time to stand up and straighten my pant legs? <laughs> or like, now would be a good time to like pensively walk over and look at the bookcase. You know, it, but now that I say that, I'm like, well, we're actually kind of close. The, this, <laughs> the second time I watched it too, um, I realized the different, the primes, different purposes. So at first it was a companion with someone with dementia, kind of helping fill in the memory gaps, giving them comfort so they, they weren't so disoriented with the world. And, and, and when you see this firsthand, it, it can be quite alarming. Like um, I spent a lot of time in a nursing home and um, this one person's room, you saw sticky notes and, and little printouts of, you know, mom, you're okay, this is where you are, don't worry, we know where you are, and like pictures because she had, the person had fallen and had to go into a nursing care, 24 hour nursing care as they healed, but they didn't, they didn't have that memory to know they were there. So every time they woke up, it, would just, it was very scary, right? So it was these cues of, you're okay. And then later on, it turned into this companion for someone who suffered loss. So it's interesting the different modalities it served or the different purposes it served. And, and it's, it's slightly different because for Tess, Marjorie Prime is there to offer closure, whereas mm -hmm. for John, test prime is for companionship or for, and like yeah. he doesn't know how to process the fact that he's missing her as much as he does. Yeah. But it, it is, it, they do, I did notice that myself. Yeah, it's interesting. What questions do y'all have for our panel? Uh, I'm gonna start over here. This is the first hand that I saw the closest to me in the blue shirt. Mm -hmm. First question, do you think AI is gonna take over the world? No, uh, I, I think we're, this is part of where we're spoon fed um, things like The Matrix and Terminators and every other TV show. And it requires us to have a certain disregard for what it is that AI is actually capable of doing. Um, we're so far from anything that even remotely resembles this. The, I, I'm not worried about it taking over the world. We, we have a, a long way to go before it even gets to the point where it's something that we can trust with a certain degree of regularity. Um, I do, on the other hand, feel like it is already in so much that we, we have, we're just not aware of it, whether it's banking algorithms or um, little tiny computers that are in our cars that are you know, calculating mileage and gas. Um, for the most part, I think artificial intelligence will be um, the same as electricity or you know, indoor plumbing. Like, you don't give a second thought like, wow, this is a miracle, I'm getting electricity out of this socket, you know? We don't think about where that comes from. And I'm sure in like 1899, my great-grandmother was like, this is amazing, or maybe this is the worst thing in the world. I don't know what she was thinking, but I think by and large it will become, or it, ha it is becoming something that's so commonplace that we, we really won't give, give it I a second I always, thought. I mean, to this day, I always think about laundry. Like, I couldn't imagine having a washing bucket and like doing my laundry. Right. I don't know, it's a weird thing, but every time I load my washer, I'm so thankful for it. Right here. Yes, she noticed the um, relationship with dogs in the film and how so much of having pets is them taking all this human emotion, and it's almost as if we're approaching AI in a similar way, asking them to absorb this emotion that's you know not native to them. So there is a little bit of therapy going on in the film in terms of just using an AI as a as that backboard. Um, what was her name? Julie, the um, mm -hmm. the in home assistant. She's talking to Walter Prime just sort of to get get things off of her chest. Um, I wonder in the movie, it's sort of a clever nod that um, our relationship with dogs is reciprocal. They love us and we love them. They don't have the capability to articulate back as we would to one another and as machines are starting to learn right now. But I think part of that was a sly wink at um, we're today, we're very far away from even having that kind of reciprocal relationship with a machine. Um, but I do feel like there will be some functions of some machines, not all machines, um, that it is their um, purpose to not necessarily sop up our emotions, but for some of us to give us an outlet to, to have something with that. I mean, even now there's, a, there's an app called Wobot, uh, so W-O-E-B-O-T, 
And um, it's a chatbot that has artificial intelligence underneath it. And um, some folks figured, I think it's um, through Stanford, if I'm not mistaken, but they figured out that um, teenagers and uh, late millennials, they don't relate to one another by speaking, they relate by chat and text. And it was a way for uh, uh, a teen to have a discussion with a bot about feeling depressed. And then Wobot gives uh, recommendations and has exercises and checks in on the user. And I, I pulled it up on my phone and went with it for a couple weeks just to see what it was like. So I think it's also a therapeutic uh, outlet as well. Over here uh, in the black t-shirt. So I'm going to try to summarize, but I don't have all your references down. But uh, essentially, the um, there's all this information coming into these AIs, and the information is you know, needs to be compartmentalized in some way. That there's you know some of it is is fact and should be part of their mode of belief, and others is is anecdote. So how do, what is the filter? Um, that helps those AIs absorb information and take it in differently the way our brains would. <sighs> That's a wow. This is a $10,000 question right here. So uh, the one thing that I really picked up on in this movie is that uh, for all of the familial relations between all of the characters, the person who informs just about every AI is John, who is not a blood relation of that family. <laughs> and that it is his retelling that actually ends up biasing all of the AIs further on down the line. And uh, I picked up on it when I watched it the first time, and I, it was something that was a little more clear. So when Marjorie passes away, the story told one time was that Walter and Marjorie went to see uh, my best friend's wedding. And then there was another retelling of it where she says, tell it to me like we went and saw Casablanca. Mm -hmm. But the reality was is that they were having a tryst or they were having sex in the hotel room and they, it would just happen to be on, on the TV. But that was the real memory. And so everything that those AIs are, are still an idealized version of who we want them to be or who John wants them to be for, for the most part. So what you're underlining is, um, this is where bias comes in, and this is where bias is scary. And if we do end up in a situation where we do have to worry about machines taking over or something, it's because we're saying something that, based on the color of your skin or your gender or something that's identifi uh, identifiable either through your voice patterns or a photograph or something else, that um, we're just simply not going to include you in this or we're going to bucket you over here because you fit a profile. And the machine is making those decisions at hyperspeed based on what somebody said first to it. So this is why uh, ethics and AI are so incredibly important, and yet it's very hard to get anybody to actually agree upon what is truly ethical in AI. My team and I have been working on a document for like six months now, and it's not something that you can throw out into the world and see if it sticks, because like if anybody saw what happened with Google Duplex, you know, on the one hand, if Google didn't think about the ramifications of what they were showing, and saying um, people might react negatively to the fact that they can't tell this is an AI making a phone call, um, then they didn't think about it. And the fact that that company, for as influential as it is, didn't think about it is troubling. Now, if they did think about it but they didn't say anything, was that the most robust user survey that was ever done where they were like, well, maybe people won't mind, but <laughs> people mind. So. Um, it's not something that we can just sort of throw out there and say, well, what do you think? Do you like our ethics? Do you like those people's ethics? Do we all need to agree on the ethics? And just getting people to agree on that is something that's fairly difficult. So, and that's all at the heart of what you're asking is, you need to make sure that it is as bias-free as possible at the beginning, and that way when you layer on top of it, it's all based on truth and not on something that I wish it to think. But, in it, but you know, Machine learning and artificial intelligence is built on data. You have to train these models. You need a whole lot of data to train the models. So if you don't have a diverse set of data, that's where a lot of the bias come in too. Well, right, and it's bias because the people who chose the initial set didn't put enough diversity into the initial set. They were like, this is good enough. These 500 faces will do. Yeah. 
all white males, right? Yeah. Or whatever it was. So we have time for two more questions. I'm going to take um, the lady in the back and then Sir in the hat right after that. Great. So, yeah. so talk about the systems already in place, mm -hmm. um, the home systems that can help give family data on the, how their aging loved one is doing, and then what are the metrics that you, they are then allowed to look at, and the ethics of having the machine sort of give them mm -hmm. making that decision. The, what's interesting is what you see on the market today is often you know, one sensor, one rule, one alert. Um, how do you add more context? If someone was leaving the stove on or the burner on because they were making soup, they didn't leave it on because they forgot to turn it off. And, and how, how can you make sure that the context of the use doesn't get flagged as you know, abnormal or, or troublesome? Um, so, so that's where we're at today. Yes, there's a lot of technology being put in homes. I think we're still trying to explore how do you have the right context, what are the thresholds. You know, most of it still is rule-based. It's, it's not AI. You need a tremendous amount of labeled data. And, and I can't quite iterate how hard it is to get that data set that's labeled. To truly know the actions normally means you have an ethnographer that validates what happened. And, and you can use correlations between all the sensors to have a certain amount of confidence and, and that's what we're working with now. Um, ultimately, a machine will not tell someone to move out of their house. A machine is not gonna do that. A machine can inform. Um, technology can be used as a tool. You can have objective data that everyone can look at and, and see what's going on, but ultimately, a human has to make the decision. Can, can you clarify that data labeling a little bit for what that would mean for a project like this? Um, like for, for us, um, the, the stove is a perfect example. You know, we, the, the sensor can say the burner was on for an hour, but what is the additional information you need to know to know was it on because someone was warming up soup or was it on because they left it on and forgot to turn it off? So, so having the, the ability to label that data and say, that's abnormal or you know, that, that is of concern is, is kind of what you need to train your models to say look for that pattern. When you see that pattern, then we know that's, and so it takes a quite amount of time to, and, and one of the things that we're trying to figure out now is what's day one? You know, the system doesn't know you. So if you put these sensors in your home and what is the initial thresholds of concern and over time, you might, the system might learn like, well, that's not a concern, that's just them. They don't, they only sleep six hours a day and they always have, and that's okay for that person. So it has to kind of learn your behaviors and they kind of touch upon that in kind of, you know, give me time, give me a little time and I'll, I'll understand better. And, and I think that's important um, with the work we're doing. Yeah. All right, last question, yes. <laughs> so the continuum between developing technologies, the kind of hardware that makes our life easier, things like the invention of the washing machine, and now we're jumping all the way to AI, and it seems like there should be a connectivity to, for other ways that our lives could become more easy, could become easier through, um, through some of these technologies. So can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, part of that is just there are certain things that appeal to us, like we would love to not mow our lawns. So there are robots that mow our lawns in the same, using the same technology that it uses to, like a Roomba to, to vacuum. Um, they're not particularly smart and we don't need them to be. The amount of AI in those things is relatively small, meaning map out a room using lasers and sonar and, and do the same thing with your lawn. Um, none of these things are articulate in their physical movements nor in their thought processes to be able to get to that place. And I, I, I'm not sure we'll ever get to that as far as housework goes. Maybe we will one day. But I've, I kind of liken it to the, um, so nobody will argue that a bird flies and nobody will argue that a plane flies, but the, the method in which a plane flies is very different from the way that the bird flies. And artificial intelligence is like that plane, whereas our own intelligence is more like the bird. It's organic. And there are certain things where a bird's flight will always be better than a plane's flight. And then there are plenty of things where a plane's flight will blow away what a bird has to offer. And 
it's the same thing with artificial intelligence that um, we are in some respects at the Orville and Wilbur Wright stage right now. You know, we see a machine that debates or that beats uh, humans on Jeopardy or that can beat the world champion at Go. And those are important moments. That is us taking off, flying for, you know, 30 seconds or a minute and then landing without killing ourselves. Good job. Um, what does commercial flight look like with this technology? I don't think any of us know yet, but there are people like ourselves who are thinking about making the tooling that allows other people to create experiences that leverage this technology. There are those who actually use those tools to create those experiences, and then there are the rest of us who just have these experiences. In some cases, we're going to want to know at all times this is being represented by an artificial intelligence. In other cases, we won't care whatsoever. Um, but it is so early. For as, as many things are happening, we are still at the very beginning of this. So I hope, for my sake and yours, that we can come up with something that does the floors and washes our laundry. But I wouldn't count on it. Um, but in some other cases, they may be able to take care of uh, things that we don't want to do anymore. <laughs> no, um, the only thing is, it's it's so interesting how how the evolution of technology and how quickly we adopt it, and and a lot of times we're not really thinking of the ramifications of it. Um, and and I often go back like two summers ago, and it talk about the validation of data. If I had cameras or microphones, I don't need sensors. I would have a real good accuracy of what someone was doing, but. Who's going to put a camera and microphone in their house? No one wants that kind of intrusiveness. And no lie, like that Christmas, the echo <laughs> went in everyone's home. But when I would survey people, I was like, well, how do you feel about having a microphone in your house? They, they did not associate Alexa as a microphone. To them, it, it was this assistant. It, it, did, it was cool. It was fun. It served its purpose. It, it wasn't listening. but it, but you have to, it has to hear you to respond to you, right? So it, it's funny how, um, and it's not like they were devious with it. It's just the, the functionality of it overcame the creepiness of having a microphone in your house. I, I have them. I love them. They're fun. Um, so I think that's a lot of it with the technology, especially with AI technology. What is the purpose it's going to serve? And, and does the value add kind of override a little bit of the concerns? But you cannot forget those concerns because that's where risk and ethics and this exposure. And it, it, there's this interesting thing that um, a person was talking about that the technology trends are, are so quick, right? They come into our life so fast and everyone adopts it. And then there's the ethics of it and that crossover is kind of where legislation and government comes in, but we're moving at such a fast rate. You know, how do we all buy into, how do we have the ethics behind it? And I think it's becoming more more challenging, and um, I think it's it's kind of an interesting area. And that's yeah, our desire for convenience actually gets us to look the other way all the time because you're talking about, well, will people want cameras and, and microphones in their homes? And yet, we carry something in our <laughs> pocket that has a camera, a microphone, and if you have anything made by Microsoft, Apple, or an Android phone, you're also carrying around artificial intelligence in your pocket all the time. And we're worried about whether or not you know, it's going to take over this or that. And yet, it's all with us right now. It rings, your it blings, it <laughs> bloops, it bleeps, and we ask it things all day. In fact, on my iPhone, and this is just, I'm thinking about this right now. I have Siri, which is built in. There's my Google app, which has Google Assistant on there. And I have Alexa, the Alexa app, which has Alexa on there. So I have no fewer than three artificial intelligences on my phone alone. And that's not counting all the other stuff that I don't know is powered by. Well, I'm sure Well, Facebook is on there, too. So you throw that in the mix as well. We've already made the commitment. We just don't think of it like that. It's this little. It's a convenience not yeah, to. Yeah, it's this little pocket computer that makes phone calls sometimes that we all carry around and look like this and ignore each other all day long. <laughs> it's there already. It has been so wonderful having you guys here. Thanks for joining us for Science on Screen. And please join me in giving them a big round of applause for adding so much to our conversation. And. 
If you came today, we'll track you down again um, for our next edition of Science on Screen. It's a great program. I hope you'll join us again. Thanks for coming out.